Hello all and good morning. I begin with paying my respect to First Nation custodians of country throughout the New South Wales, in particular the Gadigal people of Eora Nation, the traditional owners of the land on which the University of Sydney is built. I pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. I'm Omid Kave, Deputy Director for Sydney Nano Institute, and I would like to welcome you all to another exciting Sydney Nano Distinguished Lecture. As you all know, semiconductor industry has been a driving force behind many innovations over the past five decades. Um, and we are very fortunate today to have uh, Dr. Viktor Zirnov, um, Chief Scientist of Semiconductor Research Corporation, SRC in the US, which I'm sure Victor will introduce um, SRC in his talk. Victor joined SRC in 2004. He's responsible for envisioning new long-term research direction in semiconductor information and communication technologies for industry and academia. Uh, Victor has served as the chair of Emerging Research Devices, ERD, a working group for ITRS, International Technology Roadmap, for semiconductors and those who are not familiar with RTRS, this is basically where to go if you wanna know uh, where the technology and the semiconductor is, is moving um, over the next um, uh, 10 years. Uh, Victor has also held an in adjunct position at North Carolina State University and also spent six years as a research professor at the same university. His talk today focused on a uh, decade of plan for semiconductor 2030 ICT research goals. Um, I know Victor since 2014, I was just being discussing with Jim and Ben that I've always been impressed by the way that he simplifies things. He look at the fundamentals and his futuristic vision toward innovation and where the technology is heading. So it should be a very exciting talk today. Um, May I just please ask everyone to keep their mics muted and cameras off for the duration of the talk. We will have a Q&A at the end. And before I invite, uh, before we invite Victor, I just pass over the mics to uh, Professor Jim Rabo, the Deputy Director for Comm Commercialization at Sydney Nano Institute, to give you um, a brief glimpse about um, uh, the, the recent New South Wales Semiconductor Industry Roadmap. Uh, through the Office of New South Wales Chief Scientist. Back uh, over to you, Jim. Okay, thank, thank you, Omid. Um, firstly, Omid and I are extremely excited to have Victor finally over here because we've been talking to Victor since uh, more than a year. And in fact, he was booked to come here in April last year um, to meet a number of people that, that we've been talking to. So glad to finally have you, Victor, and we'll look forward to hearing what you have to say. Uh, it's a timely, uh, it, it's timely to hear from Victor, both uh, because we've recently published the Australian Semiconductor Sector Study here in Australia, which Victor actually had some contribution to and was very supportive in helping us uh, develop that, that report. And Victor's gonna be talking about the Decadal plan that was also published in January in, in the US. So there's some real parallels and what, what we're hoping down the track is to build further links and potential collaborations. Um, I wanna take this opportunity just uh, as Omid said, just to, just to reference for anyone who hasn't read the report, we have this report that Sydney Nano Institute prepared over the last one year um, through extensive interaction with industry and academics in Australia and government and produced a, a report and set of recommendations for the chief scientist, the New South Wales chief scientist and engineer, Hugh Duran White. And what we were specifically looking at is what is the current state here in Australia with semiconductor, the semiconductor industry and what opportunities exist? What could we seize and, and take forward to, to build a stronger presence? Um, so Omid, or one of us will share the link to that. We don't want to distract from the topic that uh, Victor's going to take us through, but we'll share a link and there's a, a report that you can um, jump on. I think just one last key message is that we heard very recently, just Monday from Hugh, the chief scientist, um, 
there's a lot of enthusiasm for this at, at the, the state level and the federal level. Uh, Hugh himself has, has stated publicly that this is one of his uh, top priorities to, to take forward. Um, we have other synergies like um, the Aerotropolis and the, T the Sydney Tech pre Precinct. All, all of these things seem to be kind of coming together. So really excited about semiconductors and what we can do here in Australia and very grateful and excited about the opportunity to, to hear from Victor. And so without further ado, Victor, please take the microphone. Microphone. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Omid. Thank you, the organizers, for inviting me. This is a real honor for me. And uh, today we'll talk about the decadal plan for semiconductors that sets uh, 2030 research goals for information and communication technology. Uh, I will briefly introduce the RC and the decadal plan. And after that, uh, we, we go through five seismic shifts in information and communication technologies as identified by the digital plan. And in more details, we'll uh, discuss three out of five. In the interest of time, we we'll, we'll go in depth in three of the shifts. So maybe the main message of my talk is that the current, current hardware software paradigm in information and communication technologies is reached, has reached its limit and must change. And therefore, a detailed plan for semiconductors is needed that will transform the semiconductor industry. And uh, before going directly to the detailed plan description, let me introduce my company first. So uh, SRC Semiconductor Research Corporation is the uh, uh, world first uh, research uh, consortium in industry research consortium for funding semiconductor research. It was funded in uh, 1982 by major semiconductor companies uh, such as IBM, Intel, Texas Instruments, and others. And uh, our charter is to drive innovation, to serve as think tank for uh, semiconductor industry. In a way, to tell them what to do now to stay in business 10 years from now. And uh, <clears throat> to amplify this, SRC manages uh, university research uh, in the interest of, uh, of semiconductor companies and uh, specifically focused on, on technology transfer back from the universities to industry. So this is uh, brief uh, statistics, so kind of uh, snapshot of SRC is. So we have 21 companies, members of SRC, uh, both US and international. We have Tokyo Electron, <coughs> we have TSMC, <coughs> we have Mubadala in the United Arab Emirates. And uh, so th this is what we do in as a snapshot. And once again, SRC was founded in 1982, which is uh, almost 40 years ago. And what was the semiconductor landscape in uh, 1982? What we had as industry? We had uh, uh, 256, 256 kilobit DRAM with minimum feature size of two micrometer. The microprocessors operated at uh, 10 megahertz clock uh, frequency and flash, as we know it now, didn't exist at all. Uh, the best we had was a very kind of awkward device, uh, UV erasable <coughs> programmable read-only memory uh, at very low density, 64 kilobit. And this was that time already considered kind of end of the world. And limits were anticipated to be faced uh, soon. And when SRC was formed, we immediately realized we need a plan, what we want to do, how we go from here to somewhere. And this somewhere had to be defined. So immediately SRC put together the 10 years plan, the first digital plan, 
which actually set extremely, uh, extremely aggressive goals. So the goal was 256 me megabit DRAM. Uh, again, the state of the art was 256 kilobits. So it was 1000x increase. And it was met with a lot of uh, doubts, a lot of pessimism and pushback. Uh, very prominent, famous people who some of them later uh, received Nobel Prize, they stated that 0.1 uh, micrometer is the uh, fundamental limit of scaling. Therefore, perhaps 0.25 is the limit, practical limit of scaling, and uh, we should not be put too much expectations in the future of scaling and semiconductor. And uh, this sentiment is reflected in this table published uh, uh, by in Proceedings of IEEE in 1988. As you see, the, it was state of the art of, of RAM, DRAM at that time, the dynamic random access memory. And uh, as you can see, that uh, SRC projection, it, it, it was projection, it was not done yet, for 64 uh, mega, uh, <coughs> megabit in uh, 1995 is way more aggressive than anything else. But just to make long story short, uh, we made it. And actually the 64 megabit DRAM was uh, uh, was demonstrated not uh, in 1995, but in 1994. And in 95 already uh, 256 megabit DRAM was in low packet construction. So we were very successful with the first, first uh, ever digital plan for semiconductors. And this uh, SRC 10 years plan later became the evolved into international technology roadmap for semiconductors, the famous ITRS that uh, drove the industry for, uh, for, for around two decades. And, uh, also, it influenced a lot of uh, collaborative uh, collaborative activities, like Sematech, the in the development arm of SRC was formed. And also, for the first time in history, uh, this long-term road mapping influenced uh, massive government investments in semiconductors, uh, from DARPA, from National Science Foundation, from National Institute of Science and Technology, which uh, was continued as currently ongoing pro programs. So one of the goals of the new 2030 digital plan is uh, to drive uh, 3x, 3x increase of federal investments in semiconductors. So it took two years of uh, work of very powerful committee to develop the the plan for semiconductors, and uh, it has been released on January 25th this year, because it was last month, and it could be accessed on uh, on the SRC website using the follow following link. And uh, you, you should be able to access my presentation, so and so you will have access to the to the link. And but uh, in uh, the digital plan, we identified five seismic shifts. Uh, that will transform the world and the, the industry within the coming decade. Uh, one is the analog data deluge. Second is the growth memory and storage demands. Third is communication capacity, trailing the data generation, uh, the security challenges, and compute energy. And today uh, we uh, did some di deeper dive in three of these five seismic shifts. Okay, all we will be talking about about information about bits, and uh, maybe the biggest driver behind behind all the developments in semiconductors is this chart. So it just shows how how much information per capita or total information the mankind consumed as we 
it's the evolved from the ancient times. Uh, for example, uh, in uh, year 300 BC, so at the time of the Great Library of Alexandria, the total amount of stored uh, data was roughly 10 to the 11 bits. So it's 100 gigabit. It's today it's one uh, one memory instead. Or per capita, it is thousand bit per capita, and and there is interesting correlation between the economic and social developments and our uh, rate of accumulating information. For example, in so-called uh, dark ages, the information uh, growth was pretty flat, so there was pretty stable society. Sustainable, sta stable economy, no ec economic growth, no information uh, consumption. And uh, pretty much suddenly, with what we call the Gutenberg moment, uh, we are on the track of exponential growth of information. And now, with computer revolution, it is continuing to accelerate. And uh, as of uh, 2016, still. We, we already have completed 10 to the 23 bit uh, or 10 terabit per capita and a lot of information. And if you conti continue the strength, and this is uh, now pretty, I would say, uh, rigorous uh, scientific model, science based model on how we continue to proceed with accumulating information, so data storage strength. So, we develop uh, a model that, is, that uh, identifies the upper bound or, and conserves estimated middle line and, and check uh, this model against independent uh, data. First of all, the international data preparation. As you, you can see, the experimental data fit very well within our model, which is kind of good news, right? It says that a hey, the model is correct, so we can, uh, with confidence, project how much data will be stored, say in 2040, and it will be around uh, 10 to the 26 bit, which is good news for semiconductor industry because we, as industry, we sell bits, we make money of bits, we sell for money. But the problem is if we can if we can have enough resources to produce all these bits because all these bits it's they are material they are material structure so they they have a weight they have a volume so the resource sustainability is a big question and how much bits we can physically realize and in order to put our arms and answer this question it's good to just ask this question, what is information? We talk about selling this information and what it is. And uh, based on physics, the best answer is information is a measure of distinguishability. So how well we can distinguish physical subsystem from its environment. And this distinguishable subsystem can be realized uh, by positioning of bits in a vacuum, by electronic uh, relays or toggle switches or transistors, or eventually we can put individual atoms by proximity probes and put them in different positions, spreading out the word IBM, for example. And uh, in general, information is, uh, if, if measured in bits, it's uh, uh, logarithm to the base two for the number of uh, possible states in the subsystem. So what is the smallest volume of matter needed for uh, information element? So once again, it's always material. We need a mater material particle uh, to make system distinguishing. And simplest way is to put the particle on different, say, coordinates within our subsystem. Let's say one is uh, the uh, right-hand side of the cube, and the and zero is left-hand side, and we put uh, particles creating ones and zeros. And immediately the problem is that when we put particle in one position, we cannot guarantee that it will stay there. So in order to 
prevent spontaneous transitions, for example, due to thermal oxidation. We need to put a barrier between two states, one and zero, if we talk about simplest binary system. And this takes us to the generic structure of all information processing devices. Memory cell, transistor, sensors. They always can be re represented by a barrier separating two, two states. And the whole information processing uh, job is uh, pretty much a combination of moving the ball between, between ones and zeros. Now, let's uh, ask question for memory. What is uh, the smallest volume and mass of matter needed to store a bit of information based on this structure? This uh, barrier structure immediately suggests uh, two things. One, the smallest size of our information device uh, is given by the barrier width. And the energy, smallest energy needed to operate the device is given by the barrier height. Very simple. So if we consider the storage element, and we consider that uh, when we make uh, barrier very narrow, eventually the electron, if you talk about electron-based memory like flash, it, it will lose its state uh, through quantum mechanical tunneling. And we get to this a uh, little bit later. But uh, right now, just take my word or go to publications and uh, the theoretical theoretical limit, li limit of barrier widths to retain uh, electron charge in given state for uh, roughly 10 years, which is a requirement for non local memory, is roughly 5 nanometers. Which suggests that the total size of the memory cell will be around 50 nanometer, and we can calculate the weight of one bit from th this, and it will be negative 12 uh, gra gram per bit. So we know how many bits we're going to have, and now we know the weight of uh, one bit, so we can calculate the how many kilograms of wafer scale silicon it will take to create, cre create uh, to, to store all information 2040. And the problem is that the projected uh, annual global supply of silicon uh, of silicon will be orders of, of Magnitude less. So this is the problem of, of resource uh, availability. So this is just another another chart uh, with same thing. So we just uh, so this is our exponentially growing data storage, and this is linearly growing increase of uh, silicon wafer pr production. And uh, as a side comment, uh, while some believe that uh, we have a lot of silicon on Earth and we have a lot of sand. We don't make wafer scale silicon from sand from the beach. We make it from highest quality rock crystals, and there is only handful of uh, handful of uh, mines uh, that produce uh, silic silicon oxide, the quartz of uh, sufficient purity to to do wafer scale silicon wafers. By the way, uh, some of them are in Australia. Actually, the best one best is in North Carolina, where I live, and another one in Australia. There is also one in Brazil, a couple with Russia. It's about it, in Norway. So traditional storage technologies will likely be insufficient to sustain the growing demand of storing information. So what to do? So this is one of the grand goals uh, for in, in digital plan, discover storage technologies with 100x storage density capability. Because uh, these calculations were already made uh, assuming the limits of, of uh, flash scaling for the smallest scale element. What can be done? So we took a look on all different storage technologies, optical, HDD, tape, flash, and found that actually DNA offers the best uh, solution. DNA is the information molecule of life uh, actually offers the densest storage uh, medium in universe. Uh, we preached this uh, gospel with government agencies, and the, and the first success of Dekdal Plan was that we influenced uh, National Science Foundation and uh, Intelligence Advanced Research Project activities 
to fund uh, projects, uh, uh, programs in the area of uh, molecular information storage and other biological, biological topics related to biological computation. Computation called semi-symbio. I mentioned this uh, in a second. So uh, SRC was invited to the White House uh, in October uh, 2019 to talk about semi-symbio and this its importance for bioeconomy. And uh, uh, we talked about the importance of living materials for information processing, which includes DNA storage, uh, biocomputing, biosensors. So this is uh, it, uh, th this covers the one of the seismic shifts, the membrane storage. Another seismic shift is computation, uh, the changes of computation. If you consider all computation from personal computers uh, to supercomputers and uh, create the total inventory of computations, for example, measured in computations per year, for example, in MIPS per second, million instructions per second or per year, we got certain pretty big number. And the, uh, now the question is how does it relate to our industry? Uh, from the point of view of semiconductor company, what we do, we do uh, smaller transistors, so we move uh, balls back and forth, change the state, and uh, the uh, say technology characteristic of our chip is binary throughput. How many binary transitions we can expect per chip per Per second, so it is pretty much now the product of number of transistors and the frequency of operation. And of course, we immediately okay. And, and now, how it is translated into instructions per second? How does it translate in algorithmic performance? So we took all data for all microprocessors from the very first in 1971 through 19. 19, they even been put here in this table, but not enough time uh, space, uh, and uh, and plotted uh, uh, the algorithmic performance of this process in instruction per second against the binary throughput, which is the product of number of transistors and frequency operation. And uh, we were surprised to see very strong correlation. So there is a correlation almost 100% uh, between uh, binary throughput and instruction per second, uh, which is, uh, can be interpolated by a power law uh, with exponent roughly two-thirds. Why two-thirds? We don't know, but this two-thirds exponent really defines the, defines the way we do computation. And please also note that uh, the power, uh, electrical power consumption of uh, compute chip of CPU is pretty much product of the number of binary transitions uh, and energy per bit. And next question is, uh, how can we reduce the energy per bit? What are the limits on energy per bit? Because once we want it to be as small as possible. So we did the fundamental physics analysis. First, uh, of course, we want, uh, in order to reduce energy per bit, we want to reduce the barrier height in our binary switch. But when we uh, reduce the barrier height, uh, the probability of errors of spontaneous transitions increase. The simplest error is the thermal transition, thermionic emission, that is described by Boltzmann distribution. So we know the probability of uh, Boltzmann transition over barrier. And now if we define the total loss of state when the probability is 50%, putting this 50% uh, in this equation, we immediately derive and uh, solving this for, for, energy, for, for EB, for barrier height, we obtain that minimum barrier height is Kt times natural log of 2 which of course known as uh, Shannon for Norman Landauer limit. And uh, 
which is equivalent to three times 10 to the negative 31 joule. And it is the smallest we can go. And uh, also we can apply uh, the Heisenberg principle to estimate the, the barrier width where we lost the state completely based on uh, quantum mechanical tunneling. And uh, it, it is roughly 1.5 nanometer for electron. Uh, and please note that this, this uh, calculation is for logic transistors. For, for memory, when we got five nanometer of barrier widths, we also added additional constraint of 10 years of non-volatile storage. Here, we, uh, we don't have this requirement, so we, we have relaxed, uh, uh, relaxed numbers of 1.5 nanometer, which nevertheless very close to what we have now. It's less than a factor of 10. Okay, now we know everything. We know, we know how many computations we produce in instructions. We know the relation between instructions and binary transitions. And we know energy per bit. And now we just uh, combine everything, do the math, and, and from worst installed compute capacity, capacity in MIPS, we can calculate total number of bits per year per planet and we know energy per bit and calculate total energy of computing. This is another chart for energy per bit, which uh, it is for practical uh, CPUs, for practical uh, processing chips. And uh, yes, we moving towards tunneling Heisenberg limit and Landau or Boltzmann limit. And right now we are roughly at uh, negative negative uh, 17, negative 18 joule per bit. And we still go down. And uh, once again, we can go roughly to, I mean, in the physical limits, uh, to, to 10 to the 21, 10, 10 to the 20. And now let's just, uh, with all this knowledge, let's see the future. The yellow line is the world's energy production, which is gross linearly. The, the rest of the lines are energy consumed by computing, which grows exponentially. What we see that if we stay to the, at today's negative 17 joule per bit, and we continue in increasing our computation, we'll hit the worst energy production line before 2030, which is catastrophic. Of course, we as industry work very hard uh, and we improve energy efficiency of, of, of our uh, computers, mainly due to scaling. We decrease the size of devices, of transistors. We decrease the gate capacitance. And this is, and, and we decrease the voltage, operating voltage. So we are optimistic that we go from negative 17 to negative 18, perhaps negative 19. Depends who you ask, it is pretty much practical limit. But if we are super, super lucky, super smart, and we get to the Landau limit of negative 21, which by the way corresponds to userless uh, binary switch with 50% of error probability, uh, we are still going to hit the world's energy production at uh, 24. So what to do? One immediate answer is we just stop computing, yeah? So freeze, uh, freeze our computing on a certain level and uh, don't do it more, which of course is kind of losing proposition, right? So, and we, again, we understand, uh, so uh, for the last 40 years, we utilized, uh, 50 years, 60 years, actually, we utilized the simple law of device scaling. Smaller device, lower voltage, Lower energy per bit, more bits. We are, we are happy. Now, it, for us, it's time to look at the how efficiently we convert the elementary binary transitions in computing function. And again, once again, we are stuck with this formula: the power law converting bits into MIPS with uh, exp exponent roughly two thirds. Why two thirds? By the way, we don't know. We need to understand this. But just for discussion's sake, if we 
uh, uh, can change this exponent only by 30 percent uh, moving from two thirds, which is 0 0.66 to one, we would immediately get to new trajectory with million fold improvement of energy uh, energy efficiency. Now, not on bit level, but on the instruction level. How to get there? We don't know. Quantum computing, neuromorphic, different uh, kind of uh, artificial intelligence engines. This is what we need to at attack. With. This is just another chart, same chart in a little bit different format. Uh, so we all understand that probably we will not in reality hit the world energy production. The economy will not uh, let us. So the computation will be more expensive as we approach to, uh, to the energy line. So once again, we will, we will be forced to freeze our competition at roughly 1,000 zips. That's a fraction of a second max, but less. Which would be a, of course, degradation scenario or market dynamics limit scenario. Uh, this uh, decadal plan model was checked against uh, different uh, independent references estimating the world energy production, uh, world energy consumption by computing, and uh, the reference can be found in the decadal plan document. But it's clearly something needs to be done here. So we need uh, to discover new radically new computing trajectories. And once again, we are talking about bit utilization efficiency. This is our current bit utilization efficiency. And th uh, this what, uh, so if we uh, just would change this uh, exponent to one, we immediately would have more instructions per second uh, for same number of binary transistors. This is what we are trying to achieve. How to get there? Once again, we don't have sufficient understanding of uh, computation. So we, uh, the theoretical basis for computing is much less solid than, for example, theoretical basis of uh, communication, like Schoenner limit. We don't have Schoenner, Schoenner limit for computation, and this is what we need to focus our efforts. And some of the hints on where we may look uh, for solutions is the interplay. Uh, in what we have in computer is always more than just logic transistors or, or, uh, and, or, 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 or gates or arithmetic logic. It's interplay between logic, memory, of interconnects. And back in 1990, the majority of energy was consumed in logic. But today, logic is the smallest part of energy. Actually, uh, th this is shown also in, in this chart. So the, the, the bottom yellow uh, diagram is uh, energy per transistor, the bottom up. The blue is energy per interconnected transistor. So the wires and, uh, and memory are already here. And you, already, you can see the order of magnitude difference between them. So we need to understand how to play this uh, game. And uh, today, logic, even if we operate transistors at zero energy, still memory and interconnect will take line, po uh, line portion of the energy. And now, maybe going to biology uh, will help us to get new solutions. So brain computes both with interconnects and with memory. And the increasing uh, body of uh, reports that, for example, dendrites that were regarded as a virus connecting neurons actually are like uh, mini computers in the brain. So it is uh, compute in, in interconnects. So they perform pretty complex uh, function uh, rather than just uh, passive, passive bias. And this takes us uh, once again to the question of physics of information. And, uh, which we can summarize as quantum mechanics, uh, statistical physics, and thermodynamics. And uh, this physics apply equally to silicon computer, to brain, or to bacteria. So we need to look into computing by living materials. 
and indeed uh, the living cell was shown uh, to act as general purpose processor and uh, you know to survive it needs to acquire information it needs to process information and actually react to it and uh, what we did for to stimulate this discussion uh, we defined two data points uh, we have uh, very rough estimates of brain performance in numbers of bits per second and instruction per seconds and we uh, collected this data also for E. coli bacteria. Having these two dots and, and connecting them uh, uh, gave us two, uh, an, another trajectory with uh, the exponent close to one. And of course, we know that living matter is extremely energy efficient. And for example, the brain operates at uh, many orders of magnitude greater efficiency than Today's computers so at, at 20 watt of total power and consumption, uh, brain executes much uh, more computations, more infor information processing than uh, best today's supercomputers. So alternative trajectory in may indeed exist. This uh, concludes my second uh, seismic shift on compute energy. And now I would uh, say a couple of words about analog. In fact, the word is analog. All information we acquire from the word is analog. And human is analog. We are analog. So the information from the environment is analog. The human also absorbs analog information. So what we do uh, today, we, uh, by sensors uh, and uh, all our gadgets, we first absorb, uh, receive analog information, convert it into, in, into digital form. After that, uh, process it in digital form. And but in order to uh, to be absorbed by human, even when we watch on the computer screen, as, as we do now, uh, we absorb analog information. So we need to convert all digital information back to analog in order to be uh, accessible by human. And it takes a lot of efforts, a lot of energy. So, in fact, uh, the seismic shift uh, gets from the simple observation that uh, the number of sensors absorbing in parallel information is also growing exponentially. And the total analog information gener generated from the physical world by sensors already surpass the collective human data consumption limit. So we now really need new ways. And uh, if we consider all uh, ADCs and DACs, analog to digital and digital to local converters, it takes us uh, to enormous amount of, of energy consumption and other resource consumption. But again, if we uh, look uh, to the lessons from the uh, from the life, so human consumes roughly 10 megabit per second uh, through vision, for example, which is the biggest uh, source of power information consumption. But only at most 100 bits per second are converted into conscious bits. So the comp so in other words, we deal with huge compression ratio of 10 to the 5 uh, to 1, compared to only 100 to 1 uh, achieved in, in uh, modern technology. So the goal is to achieve ultra uh, compressing sensing through analog to infrared converters with practical compression radio of 10 to the 5 to 1. So this is, uh, of course, only a snapshot of what needs to be done. But now I would like to uh, talk about next steps. So. As of January 2021, we completed the Daniel plan. And uh, now it's time to execute the Daniel uh, plan finding and uh, to convert them into ex executable semiconductor agenda towards 2030. So we dissolved the first. Uh, uh, the global committee, we called committee 1.0, and uh, formed new committee 2.0, uh, 
with uh, <coughs> the tasks of uh, execute the decla plan and derive new research directions. And in this, uh, we collaborate with the different institutions and agencies. And of course, th there are a lot of uh, opportunities in sustainable, su sustainable computing and uh, robotics, and of course, new communication technologies, human machine interface interfaces, personalized targeted healthcare and therapies. Uh, quantum computing may help us to reach uh, the state of sustainable computing. And I am uh, pleased to see the similar uh, activities, which I regard as uh, synergistic activities around the world. And uh, I just would like to mention again, Jim already mentioned at, at the beginning, the initiative at the University of Sydney on uh, uh, Australian semiconductor study or actually roadmap that outlines opportunities for for Australian industry and academia to contribute to the this very noble world world goal goal of changing the semiconductor landscape. And uh, let me summarize. My talk, the digital plan for semiconductor research is instrumental to address ongoing seismic shifts in information and communication technologies. It provides an executive overview of the global drivers and constraints for the future information uh, communication technology industry, rather than to offer specific solutions. So the document identifies the what, not the how. Uh, for example, uh, we need to discover storage technologies with uh, more than 100x storage density capability. Uh, discover co new computer trajectories with uh, exponent uh, close to one. Discover analog to information converters with practical compression ratio of 10 to the 5 to 1. Similar goals are formulated for communication and security. And we all, uh, we all need to join forces to get uh, to this goal. So uh, we often ask uh, how uh, I can involve, how other organizations, institutions can be involved in working with SRC. So first of all, please uh, go to SRC website and, uh, and uh, check for research funding opportunities which are forecasted and hosted there. So we have several uh, uh, programs and uh, in May June 2021, uh, the, the, the new calls uh, for projects in uh, several semiconductor areas will be announced. And uh, in case of any questions, please contact uh, myself, Vitizhov, or our president and CEO, uh, Thank you for your attention.